Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Disconnection, polarization, distraction, isolation. It can sometimes feel hard to show up consistently with optimism and empathy. But today's guest, Carlos Whitaker, is bringing hope to people all over the world. He's the author of four books, host of the podcast, Human Hope, and a global speaker. You may recognize Carlos from Instagram, where he's built a tribe of enthusiastic followers who join forces with Carlos to find connection, do good, and be in community. His latest book, How to Human, comes out on January 24th and is available for pre-order now. In our conversation today, we talk about how to step into difficult conversations with love, live up to your full potential, and move beyond what divides us. Let's jump right in. Here's my conversation with the one and only Carlos Whitaker. So, Carlos, a lot of our listeners are going to know you from Instagram, where you've built an unbelievable community. Give me a quick snapshot a little bit as it relates to Carlos, who you are, your life, all of that. Carlos lives in Nashville, Tennessee with his wife and three kids and six chickens and whoever, whatever else is running around in my backyard. Um, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a husband for 22 years and a dad. My oldest is 20. And then I got an 18 year old and a 16 year old. And if I could describe everything that I do, my family does all encompassing, we like to call ourselves moment makers. Um, because I feel like we're really trying to live our lives as opposed to our lives living us. And that translates into, I think it translates into all of my work, right? I think that translates into my Instagram, my books, my talks I give uh, at corporate places, wherever my talks I give in faith spaces. Like it's, it's all about helping people uh, really live, you know? And sometimes that's through um, maybe looking at, at behaviors that we want to get past and helping them do that. Sometimes that's, you know, through on Instagram, uh, you know, that community has kind of exploded in the last two years. And so, you know, we do a lot of fundraising and a lot of good things together there. Um, but just trying to remind all of us how to, how to really like how to human, right? How to do this human thing well, using human as a verb. And, um, you know, so I make a lot of videos. I travel a lot. I get up on a lot of stages. I write a couple books. I've written a couple books. And, but more than anything, I share my life every day, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, online and just try to help people feel seen and know that like, hey, listen, this sucks for me too. I know it sucks for you. And sometimes, sometimes that's the, that's the nugget somebody needs to receive, right? Like, uh, is just like, wow, Carlos's day sucks. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know. <laughs> yeah. It's good to know I'm not alone, I'm <laughs> yeah, sure. That's it. That's it. Well, and I love you call your social tribe your Insta familia. Yes, that's what they're called. The Insta familia. So cool. And and you know it's it's funny. They kind of named themselves. You know, like when I say, you know, I mean, I had a great following, and you know, even up to 2020, uh, before things kind of started scaling really rapidly on socials for me. You know, I had a really core group of followers that uh, really helped support my business and my books and my getting booked for speaking events. Um, but then when it, when it kind of went crazy and it got to 100,000 in six months and then 150,000 and 200,000. Um, I was like, this is, this feels like more of a thing. Like, like this feels like, like it's more than just a platform or my Instagram followers. Like we're doing things together. The conversation is we, as opposed to me. And, uh, and they were like, well, we need a name. 
And so like I I put up a little survey, you know, Instagram lets you do that. And and it was like either going to be like hope dealers, los amigos, like the friends, but also los amigos, Carlos. Uh-huh. Yeah, I thought that yep, was kind of yeah, yeah. cute. Yeah. Um, but none of them, they wanted Insta Familia. They, they were like, that. that is what you call us. That is who we are. And so it's become a thing where we have meetups wherever I go. And sometimes five people will show up. Sometimes a hundred people will show up. I'm like, hey, like I'm going to be at a bar at, in like 30 minutes. And like, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, 70 Insta Familia just show up like awkwardly so like, cool, man. this is weird. We're just going to meet a stranger from the internet. But I guess, you know, I get in cars with strangers from the internet. So I may as well just meet someone in real life. So yeah, you know, and uh, and it, it's turned into a whole thing and we do good together uh, and it's a lot of fun. And how did you, Carlos, and you're being humble and we're going to dig into this more because you do a <laughs> lot of good and I love it. But how'd you start building a community on Instagram and what inspired you to, to do this? I've always been an early adopter to everything. I had um, I had a podcast in 2006. Now it's obviously defunct now, but I was like, oh, what's this podcast thing on iTunes? Like, let me let me do that. Let me do this. And so I've always been kind of like a, like jumping onto everything. I had a YouTube vlog, and then I had a record deal. So w- within that, in like 2010 to 2012, 13, I, you know, I was a like a C minus recording artist. Like I, like none of my things were, you know, none of my songs were very good. I wasn't a very good singer, but I think I was really good. I think I was really good on stage, like making people feel like they're my friend. That's what people, people would come up to me at shows and they're like, oh, like, hey, this is my friend Carlos and this is my friend. And I was like, <laughs> your friend Carlos, like I've never even met you before, but I just kind of, I've had a couple of people speak into my life. Um, Don Miller was one of them that said, Carlos, like you have this gift of making people feel safe and like they're your friend. And it's, I, you can't explain it. You can't teach it. You just have it. So lean into that. So I started to lean into that. And I started to just kind of be everybody's friend, kind of like, I don't know, like the black Mr. Rogers, like on, <laughs> on Instagram and, I, and think people just kind of started showing up. I started having like, like hard conversations about really hard things, but in very accessible and grace filled ways to where no matter where you stood on whatever that issue is, you felt safe enough for me to lead you into that conversation. And I think because of that, you know, I started to see vast differences in my followers. Like, I think a lot of people have followers that just agree with them. And so that's why they're following them to get that. That wasn't the case with me. I had a lot of followers that did not agree with me, but they kept saying like, Carlos, I don't agree. I really don't agree with a lot of what you say, but man, I just can't get enough. Like you're just, you're helping me with this. And so, you know, it, it became an intentional thing to kind of start sharing more. Having difficult conversations was the thing that started to grow my platform in, in 2020, 2021. You know, again, these were conversations. I mean, gosh, you remember 2020. It's, it's just like a cuss word, right? Like no right. one wants to even <laughs> think yeah. about that. Sure. And every day, it's like, what's everyone angry about today? Hey guys, hey, come here. Let, let's talk about this, you know? And the, they're like, oh my gosh, like Carlos, I can, t- I can listen to you talk about it. And so that became a thing. And then once I started seeing how passionate the Insta Familia was about change and about justice, I said, I wonder, I wonder if they'd ever like, you know, I don't know, give five bucks to somebody that needs it. And I had an Instagram follower in April of 2021 that somebody told me about that needed, uh, she was having like a hundred seizures a day at the point and she needed a seizure alert dog. And they sent me her GoFundMe and she, the GoFundMe had been out there for, I don't know, maybe a month and she'd raised like $8,000 and she needed 30. And I was like, well, I wonder if we can give her eight more. Like, that'd be cool. So I, I posted it, uh, to the Insta family. I said, Hey, I've, we've never done this before, but like, this is one of us and she needs a seizure alert dog. Can we try to get, at least give her 8,000 more, maybe get her halfway there? And in seven minutes, we bought the dog, like the whole thing. And I remember at that moment going, okay, wait a second. What 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 have I accidentally built here? Like, like what is this thing? And Molly, like the next month, I was like, well, I mean, hey, here's a piano, a guy playing the piano at the airport. That's my favorite one, man. Yeah. That yeah. story's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I'm like, I'm just eating my Chick-fil-A and there's a dude playing the piano. <laughs> no one's paying attention to him. I sit down awkwardly close to him. Like, he's like, what is this guy doing? And I was like, I just, sorry. Like, I just wanted to like hear you play the piano. We'd get to know each other. We'd start talking. His name's Tony. He's on dialysis every night because he has kidney disease. And I just looked at his tip bowl and I was like, 
No one's giving, he has $15 in there. And I remember thinking like, I had like 50 bucks in my pocket before I even thought about telling Instagram, I said, I'm going to tip him big. I'm going to give him 50 bucks. So I, I said, Tony, what's the biggest tip you've ever gotten? And he's like, $600. And I was like, well, shit. Like, like I, I, I can't, I can't do that. And um, so I was like, well, I wonder if the Insta Familia could give him 600 bucks. Again, always underestimating the power and the drive of the Insta Familia. $77,000 later, we changed his life. And then it, it, the story goes from there. We've done it nine times, $2.7 million in Venmo and uh, PayPal, you know, donations. And it's just, it's just been fun. So we good, do we do good together? People on the left of the side of the aisle, the right side of the aisle, nobody asks me who anybody voted for before they give. We yeah, just come together. We just give. And it's become my favorite place to hang out every day. It's unbelievable. And I know exactly, I, I'm based in Atlanta. I've stood oh, and been there a hundred yes. times. So anyway, that story is... It's just joy bombs and and love and man, it's awesome. So you have a new book, How to Human, which is such a cool title. Love it. What's the important thing that you want readers to take away from the book? I want them to first admit that they need a little bit of recalibration, that the last two years of global collective trauma has maybe knocked every single one of us, myself included, off course, even like 1%, right? And I, first, I, I, I need everyone, I want everyone, I want to help everyone through reading the book realize maybe I do need to remember how to human again. And then I just want people to follow my three easy steps. You don't have to read the book. This is how you do it. You be human, you see humans, and then you free humans. Like, like that's, that is the message of the book. And I, I, I obviously go into my story uh, into a lot of ways that I was seen and I was freed. And then a lot of ways that Insta Familia has seen people and freed people. But also I give people like practical ways and practical tools on how to really do that. Because as bumper sticker as be human, see human, free humans can feel. Listen, I'm a child of the 80s. Like a, that's how I talk. That's how I learn three steps and make them all rhyme. It's not easy. It is not easy to get past a lot of these big things things that separate us from maybe relationships that we've been, that, that have been damaged over the last few years over things and politics or uh, ideas that the relationships weren't even born out of those things. So how in the world are we going to end them over these things? And so just to help people know that there is a way back. One of the things I think is really cool, you talk about the importance of knowing and embracing your identity in the book. Can you kind of share a little bit about what that journey looked like for you, for Carlos? I was raised by a black Afro-Latino, black Panamanian man from Colón, Panama, and, and a white mother, but that was, she was Mexican. So she's like European Mexican. I kind of assimilated into white, white culture my entire life, white high school. All my friends were white. I just was white. Now, what I couldn't get away from is when I wasn't around my friends, I still had an Afro and looked like a black guy. So my, my experience growing up in Atlanta and in it, living in Nashville, and I did live in LA for a little bit, was around my friends, I was just Carlos, but around people that didn't know me, um, they got to view me as what they saw me as. And so by, the whole piece of the identity piece was, for me was, you know, from 2016 to now, um, the black part of who I am had to become uh, uh, more awake. And and he he woke up in, uh, uh, like online, he woke up in my books, in my talks, in, in a lot of what I did. And a lot of my close friends weren't awake to this part of me. I have a lot of hard conversations with friends of mine that are like, why are you always talking about this now? Like, you never used to talk about this and they're right. So I actually had to have some like apology conversations with them going like, listen, like, you're actually right. Like you're not used to this, this part of my identity. And it's because I was never true to it. And so like, you have every right to feel confused and you have every right to feel what you feel. But I'm also going to invite you into who I am. You know, I, I used to always, my dad told me when I was in kindergarten and we moved to Atlanta, you know, my dad is a black guy moving to Atlanta from LA was like, Hey, listen, when people ask you, you say you're Mexican, you don't say you're black. Like you say you're Mexican. And I remember when I was a kid, not even thinking twice, like, okay. But now I know why. Like now I know why he told me to say that. And so, you know, I tell you that story because 
when I got to choose that as a as a young kid, all of my friends got to choose that too with me. And my identity was always Mexican. It just was, it was who I am. And then I took this DNA test. I got it for Christmas. I maybe may have been three years ago. And I remember not even thinking twice about it, swabbing my cheek, whatever, sending it in to ancestry.com. And then I just remember the <laughs> results coming back. And it's so funny because my wife saw me open my results and it was like, I can't remember. It was like 78% like Nigerian or something. And I was uh-huh. like, oh my God, like I'm like a Nigerian (laughs) prince and she's dying laughing and I'm freaking out. And she's like, well, what did you think you were? And I was like, I mean, I don't know. She's like, of course you're black. Of course you're from Africa. And like, it just was a moment of like, I had to have a piece of paper tell me who I was. And so like in the book, I try to help people be like, listen, if you're an Italian and you're not making homemade pasta on a yearly basis, what are you doing with your life? Like you've, you probably can make the best pasta way better than Olive Garden. So get to it. If you are from the South and you love Dixie cups and sweet tea and country music, man, lean into that. Be who you truly are. Cause we can't truly see somebody else, which is step two until you are who you were created to be. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Carlos. I was a sports agent for a long time and I remember I would I would lean on the fence at baseball games. And I was the only woman in that space when I got in there and so I would lean on the fence at baseball games to recruit players and I would look down the line of the fence and it was all dudes yeah, yeah. with khakis and polos on and I remember going, but I'm like not that guy. And what I found to your point is we connect with other people. We connect with humans when we are who we are. And when we try to show up as a somebody that we're not, it doesn't work. Doesn't. And so it's so, and it's just so freeing and so powerful to to be who you really are. And I love it. So, I, you know, one of the things, there's a lot of things I love about you, Carlos, but one of the things I, I really love is that you engage in conversations that are super important, but most people avoid them. Most people don't want to step into those. What gives you kind of what motivates you, what gives you the courage at some level to step into those conversations that are tough, that most people avoid? I would say that I know I know how important those conversations are. And, you know, I'm a, I don't know if you're like an Enneagram person or personality test yeah. person, but like, I'm like a, I'm a peace maker. Like I'm a nine. You're a nine. I'm yeah. a nine. Like I'm like a, you know, and I think when I say that people are like, oh, I can see that. Cause you're, but I also have this eight wing, right? Like this, like this, like justice kind of like part of who I am. And so I, I guess I just, I see these conversations being had on, on all of the places you can consume content and they're never conversations. They're, they're always, um, the rage filled, like pointing fingers. And I, I just think like, what, what a better place to build a space. And it's not going to sell as much as it being mad is that, that always sells more than being kind. But what if I built a space where I showed people what it looks like to listen, to understand, as opposed to listen, listen to reply. And I I began to have these spaces. I began to listen to people that didn't look like me, think like me, vote like me, love like me, whatever like me. And I began to do it in public. And I began to see so many people coming, going like, I need this. Like, like I need a place where I can feel safe enough to come. Know you're going to talk about whatever the big deal is. I mean, literally every day I open up Twitter, I look at what's trending and I'm like, what's the pain point in America today. And I think, Hey, how can I help people navigate this? Um, and I've just seen it help, help people. And so I think that's why the why behind what I do it is I am gifted in my words. I'm gifted in, in how I write. And a lot of times when I say something, people will, will take my reel or they'll take my post and they'll reshare and they'll DM me and they'll, they'll say, I've been waiting for you to say something because I haven't had the words and you've given me the words. And so, you know, it's to be somebody's mouthpiece, to be, uh, to be able to give people words to complicated things uh, is something I take pride in. And I just know that it helps people. So I want to do it. Hi there. It's Molly. I've got some exciting news to share. I'm thrilled to announce I've launched my first ever on-demand course, Up Your Game, Unlock the Drive to Fuel Next Level Success. Have the past few years left you burned out and stretched thin? Like despite your success, you know you're capable of more. Maybe you've lost your purpose and, and that inner fire to pursue your dreams. 
If so, you are not alone. So many of us have been there. As a top sports agent for 15 years, representing and working with the best of the best, I've seen and helped countless people unlock their drive to accomplish great things and finally live out their dreams. That's why I've crafted a brand new on-demand course to help you unlock your potential to fuel next level success. In my new course, Up Your Game, I share the critical eight keys that you absolutely must use to get unstuck and to finally realize your fullest potential. This course, it's not inspirational fluff. It gives you action guides so that you can apply it to your life and take action right now. So are you ready to up your game? Sign up for my new course today at mollyfletcher.com backslash course. That's mollyfletcher.com backslash course. I can't wait for this course to change your life in incredible ways. Check it out. What are some tips for people that maybe want to be better at that, right? That want to lean into these moments, whether it's with people you know or you don't know. What are some tips to help them lean into these moments and do it maybe a little bit better? Uh, the number one tip I would say is to get close. Uh, we, you see, what what happens is is in in all these hard conversations, especially if you're having a hard conversation about something you disagree with, as opposed to something that you're passionate about. Uh, let me talk to the people that maybe have a hard time getting close to the things that they disagree with. I'm constantly saying that that healing doesn't happen from a distance, and relationships don't happen from a distance, and these conversations shouldn't happen from a distance. So you have to get close, and getting close. I know. Listen, I know that it's uncomfortable. I know that maybe you get, you're going to get close to somebody that believes something that you vehemently disagree with. And you're going to look and people are going to be going like, Hey, why is, you know, why is Carlos hanging out with that person? Because doesn't that person believe this? Listen, like, like the goal for you is to understand, but you can't understand from a distance. You can't see from a distance. And I just was uh, on another podcast yesterday and I had this epiphany. Maybe somebody else has said this before, but I think it makes sense. What we want to do is we want to see somebody from far away and and make up everything that we can about who they are from super far away because we can still see them, right, from far away. I can see what they're wearing from, you know, 50 yards away. I can maybe even see that they're wearing a watch. Uh, and so, like, I can get some semblance of who they are. But, but then when I say, well, no, we got to get close to them, immediately what somebody wants to do instead of walking up to them is pull out a pair of binoculars. And then we're like, okay, well, no, now I can see them and I can look through my binoculars. But guess what? You may be, first you have to find them because have you ever looked through binoculars and you try, you see something, <laughs> but then you try to see it through the binoculars and it takes you 10 freaking minutes to find sure, it. So totally. once you find it, it's like, okay, I got it for a second, but then it moves. And then you're like, oh shoot. And now, well, now I can't see it. So yes, binoculars help you see things closely for a second, but they're the worst tool to actually help us in having these harder conversations. So uh, when push comes to shove, you literally have to put one foot in front of the other and get up close. And when you get up close, you may not leave the conversation agreeing, but actually probably nine times out of 10, nine times out of 10, I don't. Sometimes I do change my mind, but nine times out of 10, I don't agree with them. But you know what I do as I see them and I have empathy for them. And so, and, and that's what I'm trying to help people with is, no, I'm not trying to change anybody's mind on anything, but I'm trying to help you change your heart. And if I can help you change your heart, uh, that's going to be the thing that heals us way more than changing our mind is. So often I think sometimes we think, well, that doesn't really affect me, that that issue, that something that's, that's, that's wrong in the world, that doesn't really affect me. So I, I'm not really going to dig into that one, right? But I know you do. You step into those. Get me inside of your approach there, your thoughts there, your coaching there, your advice there for people around stepping into these conversations that you think, this doesn't really touch me, so I'm just going to step away and not deal with it. I do have to tell people, because I do, um, uh, I am passionate about a lot of things, and I do talk about a lot of things. There is an expectation that gets placed on me to talk about everything, right? And so because I've talked about some things, people are like, well, how come we didn't say anything about this? Like, you don't care about this? How can we say? <laughs> and, and so, like, I'll get those DMs, and I'm like, well, actually, like, if that was the case, then I would be a news anchor. And that's not what I'm trying to be. Like, I'm not trying to be a news anchor. I'm trying to help people navigate these, you know, some of these conversations and maybe take examples on how I navigated this to navigate that. So, 
I say all that to preface, you do not, I need your listeners to know, you don't have to have an opinion on everything. And you don't have to share that opinion um, with everybody. Uh, but there are people around you that are affected by almost everything that you get to. Uh, luckily, you're blessed enough to not have to have an opinion on that thing. But I mean, I tell you, like, the people that we walk by the airport, right? The, the, the people that are cleaning my hotel rooms, all of those people are affected by a lot of things that I don't have to care about. And I, I'm just trying to help leaders, you know, realize that the more they care about the unseen, the more that is going to affect your business. It's going to affect, people suddenly are going to feel seen by you because you're seeing people that aren't like you that you don't have to see. And we don't have to see those people. Gosh, we, when the people that you surround yourself with, your teams feel seen, they're going to freaking move mountains for you when they can trust that who you are away from your work or the thing it is that you do is even a better version than who you are at work or in your, you know, with your clients or whatever, man, I mean, that, that is, isn't that the person that we want to be aligned with on a daily basis? And so, um, you know, I, I think practically speaking, you know, I'm constantly looking for the invisible person. You know, I'm constantly, me, me and that freaking Atlanta airport, I did it again a couple, or we did it again a couple weeks ago. You know, I was in the food court and I just saw these I'd seen the same food court workers working like, you know, I'm in the freaking airport every week. And so like, I, I see them all the time and I was like, oh, you know what? We're going to give them a tip. And sure enough, we did it again, $120,000, you know, uh, seeing the unseen. And again, what, when, I, when you invite other people into that too, gosh, like, they, they, I mean, there's the kicker, right? It's like, what if, what if you just didn't do this thing? What if you invited those that work with you, those clients of yours, those people to actually come in with you? And that's when change can happen. And so, you know, I don't know if I've got like any like tactical coaching advice besides like every day you're going to walk by somebody that needs to be seen. That doesn't mean you raise $70,000. That could be as easy as looking at the TSA worker as you're walking through the line and saying, hey, Officer Tate, thank you for what you're doing. And having them go, that guy just said my name. And guess what? You've just breathed life into his lungs for the next hour as everyone else is cussing him out. How can we as, as individuals be more empathetic as a whole, right? Like how can we unlock that in us? I mean, Brene Brown says it the best, curiosity breeds empathy. And the more, the less curious you are as an individual, the less empathy you're going to have. And, you know, I've got this tagline that I say all the time, uh, correct me if I've already told you this, but I don't stand on issues, I walk with people. And I think that for me has been the way that I have grown in my empathy. I'm very empathetic towards people that I feel have been wronged. I am not very empathetic to people that I have feel ha have wronged them. And I was challenged by that. I, I was challenged by like, well, wait a second. Why, why am I just being empathetic towards like the down and out? Why can't I be empathetic towards towards the CEO or towards uh, towards the person I may be feel like is ignoring that person? Like, and so I I had to be challenged myself to like, how do I truly walk with people. Uh, let me give you an example of empathy that I had to do during 2020. Um, I, you know, as I'm talking about and teaching on racism and racial reconciliation and all of these things on my platform, I had very strong opinions about policing in America, right? Like I, I did because I, as a black guy, I've had my own interactions and I, I have these opinions and I'm sharing them. I am very passionate about these things. And then I get a uh, Marco Polo. I don't know if you know what Marco Polo is. It's just kind of how like old people communicate with their friends. Um, <laughs> so I get a Marco Polo from a friend of mine that I hadn't talked to in a couple years, but this is, he was a good friend of mine at, at one point. And he is a SWAT team member for the LAPD. And he's like, hey, Carlos, like, like, I love you, man. I've been following you. And like, I listen, I needed to let you know that I love you. But some of the stuff that you're saying, like, isn't actually based in reality. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, let me tell you what my truth is. My reality is, let me tell you what happened to me. Da, 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 da. And that's what, immediately where I went. And guess what I wasn't doing? I wasn't walking with him. Through a couple of days of Marco Polo's back and forth, this is what I decided to do and what he decided to do. Because he was very passionate about how wrong I was about a lot of things. I said, I have an idea. I'm going to fly to Los Angeles and I'm going to go on a police ride along with you. And you're going to fly to Nashville. 
and you're going to march in a march with me. And we're going to walk with each other. And we did that. And can I tell you, Molly, the empathy that I'm, I'm talking exploded in my heart towards man, you know, I love you. And I know I feel a certain way about no-knock warrants and I probably still feel 80% the same way, but you know what? I love you, your wife and your kids. I actually don't want you to knock when you go into the bad guys because I don't want him to shoot you, right? So suddenly, this wasn't police anymore. This was my friend, Matt. And suddenly I'm like, man, like, and so guess what? My empathy exploded for not only Matt, but for just law enforcement in general. And when he came and marched with me, he's like, wait a second, who are all these white soccer moms next to you marching at these things? Like, like what? Like this isn't what what I've been seeing on the news. This is a lot more. And suddenly, empathy grew in his heart, and that's what I'm talking about. Getting close. So, I guess the question is to your listeners: Who do you need to get close to? Like, like, like who do you need to build empathy towards? Like, call it out of yourself, and then just go and do it. There's a little part of me, right, in the spirit of being real. That's listening going, wow. I mean, and I'm down, right? But like, I think about like, like you, I do a hundred keynotes a year. I'm traveling. How do you manage your energy? We're very, very blessed. And there's a lot of hurt in the world right now. There is a lot of disconnect. And there's a lot of people who I, I could just get off this right now and go drive downtown Atlanta and just all day Pass long. by a million all day. All right. How do you manage your energy around this? How do you how do you navigate that? And what advice would you have for others? So that's such an important part of this conversation. And really part of how to human, I, I go into the first, the whole first section of being human is I believe that we are consuming content in a capacity that our souls were ne never created to consume. I believe that we know more than we were ever created to know. Uh, you and I talked about a little experiment that I'll talk about next time on your show that I did that really helped me understand we weren't created to live at the pace uh, that we're living. And, you know, number one, the first thing that I'm gonna, the first piece of advice I'm gonna give everybody is to do the thing that they don't wanna do and, and that is to slow down. Even the pace at which I'm speaking right now is driving your listeners crazy. Carlos, get to the point. Like, why are you talking so slow? Like, I'm watching the cadence of your head as I'm talking. <laughs> and like, as I slow down, think so. We move way too fast. And so the first thing we've got to do is slow down. And so like, I could never exist at the pace that my Instagram thinks I exist at, right? Like that is just like a figment of their imagination is, is what my Instagram is. No, I, I have created such balance in my life to where um, like my work hours are really short. I fly fish way more than people want to think that I'm standing in a river, allowing the cadence of that fly rod to balance me out. And so, you know, what, one of the practical, the, here's some practical things, practical things for me. Practical thing for me is I charge my phone in the kitchen. So before I go to bed, because I used to literally, I mean, I'd be an hour and a half on TikTok, shaking the bed, laughing so hard. And my wife's like, what are you laughing at? I'm just watching TikTok, just scrolling, right? <laughs> and so like, I put my I put my phone in the kitchen. Why? Because I, I, I'm i doing research for my next book and I learned this. This is crazy. That the amount of content that the average American consumes in bed before they go to bed and after they wake up is more content than my great grandparents consumed in 30 days. So what we consume in an evening and a morning back to back is more content than our, my great grand and, and in a month, right? And we wonder why we have this mental health crisis sweep, literally an epidemic sweeping America. It's because we weren't created to do this this way. We weren't created to know everything we know, right? Like, 150 years ago, people knew what the butcher was going through down the street. They knew their problems. They knew their family's problems. They maybe knew what the priest was going through and a couple people in their parish or whatever, but they didn't know what was happening in Afghanistan. They didn't know every single day what was happening at these atrocities everywhere. And I just don't think that we were supposed to know all that stuff. And so, so another tip, little practical hack that I've done is not only do I charge my phone somewhere else, but I subscribe to this really cool thing. Um, well, two things. First thing is I bought an alarm clock because people are like, well, how do you wake up? I actually went to Target. They actually still sell these things called alarm clocks that just wake you up. That's all they do. But the second thing I did is I subscribed to a 
this thing called a newspaper. Like every morning, <laughs> it's crazy. Like I still, I love the news. I love to hear about what's happening in the world. Every single morning I wake up, I walk out like freaking leave it to Beaver's dad with my robe and my coffee. And I don't know who drives by at 5.30 a.m. in their Trans Am and throws it in my yard, but some person is still throwing a newspaper. And that that is, that's how I consume my news in the morning. And I don't look at the news any anytime else throughout the day. So I read it in a paper and that's it. That's how I get it. If something, if something big happens, of course, like I'll watch things, but no more Twitter doom scrolling, newspaper, alarm clock. When I have my cup of coffee in the morning, oh, where'd my coffee mug go? It was right now. I just have my cup of coffee. I don't scroll my emails. I just taste, and guess what? My coffee tastes so much better. One, one last thing on this whole idea is when I was in Italy last year with my family, this whole idea really came to light for me and I saw it in a human experience. We were going, I don't know, traveling like a hundred miles or they use kilometers. I still can't mm-hmm. figure that out. But <laughs> um, as uh, we stopped by a gas station and I remember Heather walk, saying, hey, can you get me a cup of coffee? Um, she was waiting in the car. I was like, yeah. So I went in and I ordered two cups of coffee to go at this gas station. And they looked at me kind of weird. And they were like, oh, you want that uh, You want that carry out? And I was like, yeah. And they they kind of started talking to each other like they didn't know what I was talking about. And then, I, and then I turned and I looked and I noticed that there was like seven people just leaning against the, the bar, sipping their lattes and sipping their coffees. And it, it hit me. Holy crap. Like it probably only takes them three minutes to just sit and savor their coffee. But here in America, we're like, oh, to go, to go, to go. So do you know what I changed? I never take my coffee to go anymore. If I go to a Starbucks, I always drink it there. And if I go to a coffee shop where they have ceramic mugs, I always ask for it in a ceramic mug. Yes, it may take five extra minutes, but there's something about that that activity that slows me down to where I just start experiencing. And so all of that to say, that stuff is what helps me when it's go time. And when it's like, hey, it's time, it's time to Insta Familia. We're going to go 24 hours giving blitz. Let's go. I'm rested enough to do it. Hi again, it's Molly. I hope you're enjoying the show. If you're a go-getter who wants to conquer overwhelm and sharpen your focus, I want to let you know about my new free webinar training, Purposeful Productivity. This free webinar gives you a framework to unlock more energy for what matters most and to finally beat burnout. Head over to mollyfletcher.com backslash webinar to access this free training and my new life-changing energy management framework. That's mollyfletcher.com backslash webinar. Head over to mollyfletcher.com backslash webinar to access this free training and my new life-changing energy management framework. That's mollyfletcher.com backslash webinar. Can you talk a little bit about your own spiritual journey, Carlos, and your relationship with the church? Yeah, yeah. I um, my, my dad is uh is a Southern Baptist preacher. My dad, I grew up. Um, my dad was pastor of Primera Iglesia Bautista de Pico Rivera, first bilingual Baptist church in Pico Rivera, and so I grew up. Which what I with what I feel like is a very um healthy example of somebody that was following their relationship with God, and um yeah. So I mean, I I had no like growing up trauma. I had no you know whatever it was. It was really good. My, my relationship um with God was really good. And into my adult years, I feel like I had a a healthy yet incomplete view of, of who God was in my life and the church was in my life. And then, so this comes twofold. So this story is twofold. The, the first bit of kind of adult trauma with my spirituality was when my daughter got admitted to Vanderbilt Children's Hospital for like a month. It was like in the most pain I've ever seen a human being in for 30 days. It was 
And I, it was it was the whole like God, like what are you doing? Like like why won't you come through? And that was when I really had to lean uh, onto the supernatural, right? So like if you're if your listeners uh, are into spirituality at all in any way, shape, or form, you know I believe in the supernatural. I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. I believe in that the whole spectrum of who Jesus is in my life. I had to go to a place supernaturally that I never thought I'd have to go to. I had to beg God. I didn't have to beg God, uh, but I was. And and it was a very traumatic, uh, yet it propelled me into a space of not kind of being like a Sunday church guy, but like, oh my gosh, no, I need this 24 seven. So, so there was some healing that happened there um, and some growth, I think that happened there. But then 2020 showed up and Oh my gosh. I mean, this could be a whole episode itself, but let, <laughs> let me just, let me just tell you that like as a, as a as a black guy living in Nashville, Tennessee, I suddenly started to see a lot of preachers and a lot of churches that I looked up to completely ignoring me and completely ignoring the justice that I was trying to seek out. And not only ignoring me, but when I began to speak up on things of race, actually uninviting me. And and as much as I love the corporate space, I'm probably 80% in the corporate space now. That's when that happened was because the faith space uninvited me because maybe it was a little too dangerous to bring Carlos in because what if our biggest tither, you know, uh, here disagrees with something he has to say. So there was actually a lot of church trauma uh, and wounding that happened to me in 2020. Now, my own local church here in Nashville, there they didn't wound me. They invited me on stage to talk about my pain, to talk about what I'm, and so there, there was, you know, two things can be true at one time. The church in general could be a little bit crooked, but your local church can still be safe. Mm -hmm. And so what it did was it allowed me to start finding the safe places for me in my faith, the safe pastors I could talk to. And, you know, that's the beautiful thing about social media is you get to see people now, they talk about everything and they, they, they're, you can see who they're following. You can see what posts they're liking. And, uh, and so it did become really complicated for me, but I think at the end, you know, God for me, and, you know, I believe in, uh, that we can actually speak to God and he speaks back. Uh, you can read all my old books for that stuff. Uh, but I, I believe in conversational intimacy with God. And I, and I began to, to speak, instead of trying to speak to a pastor, I was like, why am I, why am I going through the middleman here? Let me just, <laughs> let me just go, let me just go straight to the guy. And yeah, I started hearing from God, um, very specifically and man, the craziest supernatural things started to happen in my life. And I'm a big advocate of the church. I, I still am. Like I, I tell people all the time, I know that the church isn't perfect. And if there is one, the second I walk in there, it's no longer perfect. But if you can find a safe enough place where you know that the leaders of that church are truly caring for the unseen, for the oppressed, for and specifically check on orphans and widows. If that church ain't touching them, run like as far as fast as you can. But for me, it's it's been a it's been a complicated yet very fruitful journey in my life. And it's one that I would not be the man I am uh, without my relationship with God. So Carlos, how can people find out more about your new book, How to Human? Yeah, well, it's it should be if if my team has done it well, it should be everywhere you buy books. Uh, How to Human, um, you can if if you want to. There's I got extra stuff obviously on my website carloswhitaker.com uh, with two T's. So like I'm gonna have a like a How to Human um, kind of like small group like book book study guide there that I'm working on right now. So that may not be ready for a few months, but that's coming. Um, and then you know if you want to hang out with the Insta Familia. Come jump on Instagram and uh, and jump on. And I think you'll have fun and I think you'll have a good time. I love it. I love it. All right. So, Carlos, you've been awesome. I want to finish with rapid fire. I want to honor your time. I'm stressed. No, man. We got this. Okay. Okay. We got this. All right. What's your favorite book? Oh, my favorite book is sitting right in front of me and it's a brand new favorite book. It is by Eddie Helsom, An Interrupted Life. And it's letters from her as she was in Amsterdam. This was, she's a little older than Anne Frank. And and she writes it from like a young 20 year old uh, about love in Amsterdam and then during the occupation and then her trip, uh, not, it wasn't a trip, when she went to a concentration camp. Um, this book literally changed me this year. Wow. And it's again, Eddie, E-T-T-Y. Uh, and and it's, it's actually,
actually like a really, I had a, um, a monk uh, tell me about this book. Um, and so she had a really spiritual experience. She was super ag agnostic. And then through the, the Holocaust, came to a relationship with God in a way that none of us ever will. And so that's in here too. It's, a, it's an incredible book. I'm glad wow. it was right in front of me. I'm glad you asked. Yeah, I love it. A friend of mine's reading that show is unbelievable. Oh my gosh, so, it's so good. That's so good. So what's one thing that people would be surprised to know about you? Okay, I, th I think uh, cover up the tiny years if there's ever uh, either tiny years listening right now, <laughs> but that I played Eeyore at Disneyland. Oh, let's go. Yeah, yeah. So I was Eeyore. And then uh, those were on depressing days. And on good days, I, I got to be Buzz Lightyear. But uh, m most of I the days- you were good at that, man. Yeah, I, I had a blast. That was my, my, I was 21 years old when I got to do that. It was in Disneyland, the true Disney here in America. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. What's one thing you wish you knew earlier in your life? I wish I, lear I learned earlier the importance of slowing down. Honestly, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. the importance of what I call God speed, like the speed of God, and that that um, I don't have to. It doesn't have to be hu hustle and grind, and probably it shouldn't be hustle and gr there's there's of course things that I still hustle with, but that that I really need to slow down, and that it's not about speeding up because. Here I am, like it, it is 2023. I am coming upon my 50th year of life. And I've got probably, I mean, maybe not, but probably less life in front of me than I have behind me. And man, just to enjoy the moment, uh, just to slow down, get off your phone, you know, stop taking pictures of everything that you do and just watch it, just experience it. What's a difficult conversation that you've been avoiding? Oh, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um... Okay, no, here's one. Here's one. This this is more personal than it is um uh like public difficult conversation, but uh it's it's a conversation with uh my daughter, my 18-year-old daughter about her moving out. Um I don't want her to. And I know she does. And I know she needs to. And I love her with everything inside of me and can't fathom waking up and not walking by a room and seeing her sleeping until noon. I guess she's 19 now. That, that's a conversation I don't want to have. I know it's coming in July, but I don't want to have it because I don't want to think about it. And that's a hard conversation that I've been avoiding that I need to have. Thanks for uh, counseling me, therapist Molly. <laughs> All right. So the show's called Game Changer. So who is a game changer, dead or alive, who inspires you and why? This is going to be really weird. Though I, I would never even think I would answer this this way. Um, but there's a vlogger on YouTube um, that I actually have enjoyed following him the last decade and watching how he has, he literally has changed the game. He he literally single-handedly changed YouTube. His name's Casey Neistat. Uh, and he is a, he was a daily vlogger that vlogged for 800 days his life. Literally, these were like cinematic masterpieces every day, like just the storytelling and the transitions and everything. And I think he's literally changed the game on, um, on storytelling. And and he's a, he's a person that what's beautiful about all of his work is it's all there. If you go to YouTube and you search Casey Neistat, you can start at vlog 001 uh, in wow. 2013 and you can watch it all. And he's somebody that inspires me. And I think he's changed not only the game for um, storytelling, but he's changed my game on how I tell stories. And a lot of how I do these giving blitzes on Instagram, I learned from him. Wow. Carlos, you inspire me oh, to be Molly. better, man. I love Thanks. this conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for having me and for just trusting me enough to have a conversation in front of your people. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. This episode was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. Check it out. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.